Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Let's get started. Um, okay, today we're going to talk about uh, task concurrency uh, within, uh, specifically within CUDA. But I'm going to try to generalize a little bit as we, um, as we go through today's lecture. Okay, now before we get into it, just let me present the last sprint, essentially, for the course, just so that you're aware of what's, what's left. Okay, so here we are today, uh, lecture 22, and lab six is due on Friday. Lab seven is due next week. And what we have essentially is one more lecture next week uh, that I will give and Professor Kindra Tinka will give on going beyond CUDA. So open ACC, open CL, and a few others. Yeah, because the world is bigger than CUDA. And I mean, CUDA is quite important and quite large, but there's other stuff happening. And then what we'll have is a couple of guest lectures one from AMD, where um, my good friend Ben Sander will give a remote lecture on AMD's efforts within this space. AMD, or, uh, AMD has, um, clearly they create GPUs just like <laughs> NVIDIA, and their GPUs you know, are similar in the sense that they're going after similar capabilities to NVIDIA GPUs. So it stands to reason that AMD wants to create something where people can create code like CUDA to run on their hardware. So Ben actually leads that entire effort. And like you, Ben was a graduate of the ECE department quite a while ago, but... Um, so Ben will give a guest lecture next week. Um, on that. And then following, we'll have a guest lecture from, from Intel, uh, James Reinders, um, who, like me, graduated from University of Michigan. Uh, I knew James, I've known James for quite a while. And James will talk about um, Intel's efforts around one API and uh, sickle, as they call it. Uh, which is their compute language and all their tools. And then we'll have a course retrospective and then we'll be done. So there's not much more left. And in fact, the remaining lectures are really about broadening. Right? We already know the concepts. And now it's really a matter of going beyond and then looking at what else is happening in the world. And then, of course, in the background, we've got the project. Uh, project Milestone 3 to December 2nd, where you, yourself, will be implementing um, you know, the GPU optimizations on the kernel, on the convolution kernel. And then our midterm on December 6th, by the way, there's no final exam. And then, the final competition, which is optional, where you can compete with your colleagues, classmates, on seeing who can do the best on the project. Okay. So that's what we have to look forward to. It's really the end game here. But any questions? Okay, good. All right. Now, I know that a, quite a few of you have been interested in um, my course that I'm offering next semester. Well, it's finally approved as of yesterday. So it will be a 498 in the spring semester. I am only taking 30 students because if I fail, I don't want to impact more than 30 of you. 
So this way we can limit the damage. Um, it's a hardware-oriented course, so it's not for everybody here. Uh, you will have had to have taken 411 prior to taking the course. Okay. The topics of the course are really more, you see a lot of similar things to what we talked about in this course, but they're really going to be driven from the hardware perspective. For example, what SIMD and vectorization. Yeah, we kind of know what those mean from this course, but what does it mean from a hardware perspective? What does SIMD mean? What does vectorization mean? What are the various design points on that very, very large spectrum? Um, ASICs, I, I'm sorry, FPGAs, uh, memory architecture, network on a chip. Uh, those are all topics we'll cover. And then some software abstractions, so similar topics to what we talked about in this course, but maybe a little more abstracted, not very CUDA specific. Some case studies, and from a topical perspective, that's it. Okay, that's a lot to cover, but that's not what this course is about. It's not about the lectures. It's really about the project. Okay, and the idea here is that you working in teams of four people, let's say, three, four people, are going to build in Verilog a extension to a RISC-V processor that will accelerate some set of workloads. So you'll get to define the workload kernels. Maybe you want to do a matrix multiply. Why? You'll justify it. You'll build example reference implementations of the workloads. We'll design an architecture. You, your team will design an architecture. You'll implement it in system Verilog. All of it, right, to the point where it actually needs to work. If it doesn't work well, you, you, you just can get there. Um, um, uh, and you'll be synthesizing it, meaning you'll be measuring how many logic gates, standard cells, its area, its power, its performance, um, you will be doing metrics-driven iteration, meaning you'll build something. It won't quite work right. It'll be too slow. Maybe it'll be too big. Maybe it'll be too power-hungry. We'll iterate and iterate and iterate. And then final deliverable. Okay. So here's a chance for those of you who are interested to really understand at a very low level, full detail, what such a hardware component is all about. It's your hardware component. I'm not going to tell you to build a matrix multiply accelerator. I'm not going to tell you to build a graphics accelerator, this or that. You get to pick. You get to motivate it, and then you build it. That's the whole idea. Okay, and now, because I've been doing this for a while and running teams in industry, I know where we, we kind of fail from an academic perspective. We don't really get you ready for that team environment. In fact, the team experiences that we give you are pretty lame here, I have to admit. But we're going to try to remedy that here in the sense that it will be a team experience where we will run the teams like you would be run where you want a project at NVIDIA. Right? There's got to be some accountability and responsibility, stakes that are meaningful so that, you know, it's not one person doing the project, but everybody, so that we can aim high. So we're going to use this idea of agile and sprints and stand-up meetings. Um, so, you know, it'll, it'll be quite an experience for those of you who want to embark on it. Um, Anyway, okay, it will be there. It's going to be a 498 offered alongside all the other 498s. Um, I know that several of you have sent me email about it. What I will do is I will send everybody who has emailed me a copy of the syllabus. Now, no guarantee that you can get in the course because, I don't know, the university has its own way of, you know, letting you get into courses. Um, 
So however that works, 30 people. Uh, I would imagine that 30 people sign up, but not all 30 are really ready for the course. So probably the first few weeks, some people are gonna drop. Maybe you'll be able to get in if you can't get in at first. Okay, any questions on the course? If it all goes well and doesn't fail, I'll offer it again. So this way, if you haven't taken 411 and you want to take this course, you may get a shot at it in fall uh, 2023. So my plan is to offer it twice at a minimum. Okay? All right. Well, let's move on. And talk about task concurrency. Okay, so, you know, in the early days of CUDA, there was, this wasn't there. It came later. And I remember a very early critique of CUDA was, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, you can create a kernel, you can run the kernel, kernel runs on the GPU, and you can copy data and blah, 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 blah. But there's no task concurrency. CUDA is dumb, it's brain dead. I remember that being a very big concern. And because I was in the space, maybe I was one of the people that also said that. Okay, because I realized, hey, you gotta have this in order for a system to be really complete. And it wasn't there in the early versions of CUDA. But it came. It came soon, it, you know, it seemed like an eternity, but it came maybe three, four years later. Um, and it kind of dawned on me that, hey, you know, everything has a roadmap, right? That even though, even though you don't have fully complete something right at the very beginning, as long as you're alive long enough to get there, fine, you've gotten there, right? So it was important not that CUDA had it in version 1.0, but that CUDA survived long enough. There was enough of a committed investment from NVIDIA so that by version, whatever it was, you know, 1.11, I, I don't know what version it was, that ultimately it made it in three or four years later. Okay, that's kind of important to realize. Now, what is this task concurrency? I want to paint a picture in your mind. Okay. Because now it's very clear to you what we have in front of us. Right? We've got uh, the host. All these systems have hosts where all the big ugly code is running. Right? The big ugly code being the operating system and user interface and blah, blah, blah. And then we've got the accelerator where the heavy lifting is happening. Or most of the heavy lifting, anyway. And, well, these are two very big pieces of silicon, right? Those are very powerful, expensive things. And at a very minimum, we want to keep both engaged, right? Why would we want only the GPU to be executing and the CPU to be idle? Doesn't make sense. So when we talk about concurrency, I like the word concurrency to be different than parallelism. Because to me, concurrency means something very, very different. Okay, concurrency is the orchestration of big tasks. I want something running on the CPU and some stuff running on the GPU. The stuff running on the GPU is parallel. Hundreds of thousands of threads. The stuff running between the CPU and the GPU is concurrent. A bunch of big things running together. And the way we've managed these things, it turns out, is different. We can't manage 100,000 threads carefully. They just got to do their thing. They just got to be blindly parallel. The way we manage two big things running, however, can be subtle. It can interplay. There can be synchronization, and it's okay. All right? 
But the, the image I want to put back in your mind is, hey, I've got these two things, and I want them to act concurrently. That's not it. Because between them, I've got a bunch of shared resources. Specifically, I've got this data channel between the CPU and the GPU, the PCI Express interface, which if you, you know, I'm sorry I missed last lecture, but if you saw Professor Kindratinko's lecture, you now realize that the PCI Express interface is bidirectional. Okay, meaning I can send data to from the host to the device at the same time concurrently sending data from the device back to the host. Okay, so if we kind of go back to our mental view, CPU, GPU, data transfer, data transfer, let's view those big four pieces as items that we want to keep concurrent. All right, and that's what all this is about. That's what I mean by task concurrency. Okay, now let me give you a quick story. Uh, many of you know that I uh, ran Personify uh, for oh, quite a while, and uh, Personify was a uh, kind of a leader in immersive video. And if you've ever used Zoom and you know about the background replacement, well, Zoom uh, you know, ended up doing that as part of the COVID work from home, everybody's at home isolating thing and kind of burst into the world. But we had been working on that for 10 years prior to that moment. And what we, uh, we, we in fact, one of our claims to fame is that we did a lot of that virtual background, you know, uh, foreground background segmentation in machine learning just at the point where machine learning, deep learning came about using deep convolutional neural networks to do that image segmentation. Now, the thing about it is it has to happen in real time, right? Because, you know, you're, the camera's here taking images of you and that's what a video is. Um, 30 milliseconds, right? Remember, we were talking about 30 milliseconds last time, and things happening in real time. So in 30 milliseconds, what we have to do is take that image and separate the foreground from the background. And there's a very deep neural network that's running to do that. That's what we were using back in 2014, 2015. And to do that in real time was next to impossible. That's where smart people like yourselves who had taken 408 working for Personify ended up putting a huge amount of intellectual energy to figure out how to do that. This was the days before uh, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch would do it for you from Python. And we had to do it ourselves. Now, one of the big things we ran into, right, is just simple problem that, hey, I've got this data, came off from the camera, it's sitting on the CPU. It's a couple megabytes of pixel data. Um, I gotta do a bunch of stuff to it. Namely, I have to separate the foreground from the background, create a mask, that's essentially what we did. Um, and that mask has to be back at the CPU so that we can send it over the network. That's essentially how a video call works. Oh, by the way, we have to encode it as well. All in real time, 30 milliseconds. So now, yeah, there's a GPU here, and we're gonna put it on, you know, there's a lot of CUDA code. Actually, we're using OpenCL. So we gotta take this big hunk of data, put it on the GPU, run this big convolutional neural network, multiple layers, training weights, and all that stuff happening here. Oh, and by the way, uh, there's about 10 other steps beyond the deep neural network that we have to do that are more conventional image processing to convert the color space, to refine the edges, to do this other algorithm that are also very intensive. 
So our first few versions of the code kept pushing data back and forth between the CPU and the GPU because we would have code that was GPU friendly that we'd run and run on the GPU and then we'd have CPU code for this ugly you know, decision making more graph like algorithms that were hard to accelerate on the GPU. And we found ourselves just swishing this data back and forth, wishing we had known how to do it better so that we can run things with much more concurrency so that we weren't spending our time. In fact, the bottleneck for our first few versions was the PCI bandwidth. The stuff on the GPU ran in an instant, a couple of milliseconds to do the big neural network. But then sending back the intermediate data so we can do a processing step on the CPU, and then this and that, it was a lot of PCI bandwidth limitation. Eventually, we started to use these concepts. They're not hard, they're subtle. And then gradually, we winnowed everything away to the point where we were able to achieve things we wanted to achieve in real time. Okay, so super important concept. So what is this? Let me just kind of set the stage. Okay, so let's say we're doing a vector addition. Very simple algorithm, right? You can remember this from our first lab assignments. Yeah, question. Yeah, you know, incredible amount of stuff has happened in the last five or six years. So what's happening, so a couple things. Um, first is on the algorithmic side, right? So algorithmically, we, I mean, we were like the first group of people to run this real time. So we were running something that was 32-bit floating point. Okay. Uh, actually, it was the 32-bit integer. Okay. Well, actually, the first version was probably 32-bit floating point. We didn't know any better. We just had to get it to work. So all the data coming in, converted, running at data types that were far too big for what we needed. And the network was probably far too big and far too inefficient and crappy compared to today's uh, networks. Um, and then also what happened, so, you know, okay, so fine. You know, and of course, our CUDA code probably was way, way, way inefficient compared to what people are doing today, okay? But then also what happened is Intel realized uh, and AMD realized, hey, wait a minute. All this image processing is happening on this, you know, non-Intel and non-AMD silicon. NVIDIA, why should NVIDIA get to do that? You should just, you know, a cheap, you know, Chromebook should be able to run this and the cheap Chromebook doesn't have a discrete NVIDIA GPU on it, but it's got an it's got a Intel integrated graphics on it. So let's build the neural network acceleration on the Intel accelerated graphics. So algorithms got better. Intel integrated graphics and AMD graphics got better. And the third thing is the software tools got better. The CUDA and the Intel tools and the AMD tools got better. So that it was easier to just, you know, take your code, write PyTorch, and it just, boom, automatically gets accelerated. Make sense? Yeah. You know, I have this um, kind of a quip, let's say, that it's not always the first company or team or person to realize something that wins. Right? It's, re it's sometimes the second or third because you see all the mistakes that the first guy did. And the first guy has to do all this stuff and heavy lifting to prove the point that the latecomers don't have to. So uh, 
you know, and I don't know if I, I happen to run races, not that I'm not that I ever finish first or second or third, usually in the middle, but long distance running, kind of have a group of people around you. And I never like to be the person in the lead because the person in the lead is expending all this energy to be in the lead and all I'm trying to do is beat that person, <laughs> right? So I let that person expend the energy and then I come in. It's kind of a, a common running tactic, but it's my point that, you know, the, that first person is always blazing the trail and doing all this hard stuff when things catch up and become much, much easier. And then people wonder, well, yeah, of course, everybody does that now, so what's the big deal that you did it back then, right? Anyway, makes sense, sorry. Digressive answer. Okay, uh, any other? By the way, digressions are good. Yeah, I wish we had more of them in this class. Any other questions? Yeah. That in itself is gonna turn into a 20 minute response, okay? But let me tell you, one of the coolest things about that, you know, and by the way, I won't go into the details of it because that will take 20 minutes, but this is something worth looking at, okay? Like if I had to pick, I don't know, the, the, the top 20 engineering marvels that I feel in computing that I've come across, this would be one of them, okay? It's, uh, uh, clockless data transfer. All right, and the idea here is, you know, um, you know, when we built a system where uh, there's a clock, right? We've got two things, they're trying to communicate, and it's much easier to do it if there's a clock. Okay, I need to send a bit. There's a clock signal, I need to make sure that that bit is valid on the edge of that clock signal because the other receiver is only paying attention at that clock signal. All the other time I could be screwing around, putting whatever, but at that clock signal, the data I'm putting must be valid. That's the idea of a clock, right? But now that clock is gonna impose some overhead, right? Because I have to communicate around that clock. Maybe I can communicate faster or maybe I communicate at the same rate as the other guy, which is really what we want. But without the clock, I can be doing it at about, you know, let's say 20% faster because I don't have to pay the overhead of that clock. And in a real engineering system, that's the case. So okay, let's remove the clock. Let's let the data itself synchronize us. Okay. And the idea here is we're going to encode transitions. Okay, anytime I transition, that's going to be some information content. So if I'm trying to communicate to you the pattern 110011, what I'm going to do is take that five bit pattern and put it into enough transitions so that you can unambiguously, without the clock, get the data out. Right? So. That's the idea. Now, why is it 128, 130? That's the 20 minute exposition, which, you know, if you're interested, there's a bunch of good wiki pages on this. Okay? Yeah. And that's the way the PCI Express operates, by the way. There is no clock, um, the clock is recovered from the data. Right? And a lot of systems that are long haul systems, optical systems, or you know systems where you have to communicate across a big long distance where clocks are infeasible, they will use this clockless scheme. Okay, all right, good. So back to our vector ad. So we have kind of this canonical situation in vector ad where the way we have set it set it up, it's horrible. I transfer vector a. 
Take some amount of time. I transfer vector B. Take some amount of time. Okay, at that point, the device has A and B, and therefore it can actually do the kernel. Kernel gets launched, uh, data gets generated, at which point, when it ends, I can transfer the result back. Zero concurrency. The original CUDA looked like this. Clearly, NVIDIA architects did not have this in mind when they originally proposed this. So, um, like I said, the idea of this concurrency came subsequently, and what you had to do is you had to make sure that the device you had, the GPU you had, would actually support this concurrency by looking at a property called device overlap. Now every GPU supports this. I, I doubt you can even find a GPU that doesn't support it. And if you did find it, it probably wouldn't work anymore because you know, something is aged out within that GPU. Probably couldn't find device drivers to run it. Okay. So, well, what is it that we're really looking for? What we're really looking for is kind of this ideal, in fact, this doesn't even tell us the ideal, it gets close, where what we're doing is right here. Okay, so what I'm doing is, if we take a look at this slice right here in time, I'm transferring, actually, so what, let me back up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break everything up a bit. So it's not one vector, or not two vectors, that we're summing. But let's say in this particular case, we've got a bunch of vectors. Okay, we've got a batch of input. Or maybe what we've done is we've taken our very long vector and broken it up into, in this case, three or more batches. Okay, so at the beginning of time, what I'm doing is, okay, I gotta transfer to A0 and B0 and then once that's done, I will start computing C0. And while I'm computing C0, well, I'll transfer the next batch, A1 and B1. And then, here we go. While I'm computing C1, I'm transferring the results of C0 back to the host while I'm transferring A2 and B2 to the device, right? So here I reach that beautiful steady state. That's where we wanna get. And let me throw in there, ideally, if there's work to be done on the, C on the CPU, the CPU is also engaged, right? That's the beautiful harmonious concurrency picture we wanna develop. And if you're really, really um, uh, kind of high performance oriented. There's another level, which is, hey, my, my CPU has a bunch of cores, physical and virtual. So now, not only do I want some stuff happening on the GPU and PCI transfer, but I want my CPU cores to be equally engaged. And at that point, your system overheats and it won't, but you get the picture, right? So, okay. So how do we accomplish this? Accomplish this in uh, a modern CPU, uh, GPU? And it turns out the extra ingredient that we have to add to make this all work is quite easy. The software abstraction is trivial, <coughs> super trivial, super easy, and it uses the idea of a stream, okay? The idea here is um, we're gonna take the host side code that does all the CUDA mem copies and kernel launches. We're gonna add this idea of a stream to it so that we start to get this concurrency that we want. 
And the way to think about a stream, it's just a queue. So what I can do is I can say, CUDA mem copy, kernel launch, CUDA mem copy, kernel launch, kernel launch, blah, 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 and load up a stream where the stream says, okay, this set of things must execute in order. But if I have multiple streams, those streams relative to each other can go in any order they want. Okay, that's the simple idea. Okay, the stream is a queue, and we just load up that queue with commands, and those commands execute. Question. Yes. Uh, a yeah, very rich set of events can come back. Yeah, I'll show you a few. Okay. Okay, so simple concept. Okay, so how do we put it into practice? Uh, actually, I'll, I'll show you how to put it into practice, but let me... Uh, start off by saying the very simple conceptual view of a stream is that what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take these commands, mem copies and kernel launches, and we're going to assign them in our code to a stream. Stream 0, stream 1, stream 2, stream 3. We can create as many as we want, and we get to assign these things into a particular stream. Here, I'm going to put memcopy a0, memcopy b0, kernel, z, kernel 0, and memcopy c0 into stream 0, and then so on for stream 1. And now what happens is there is what we'll call a kernel engine and a copy engine that are running in the CUDA system, combination of software and hardware, where these engines will pick off these commands, these operations, and execute them. So the first thing to go, uh, you know, let's say we load up these streams. There's a mem copy A0, mem copy A1, and it's the copy engine that will do the mem copies uh, that will execute one of those two. And then when it's done, it'll pick whatever comes next. And then the kernel engine would execute the kernels. Okay. So really what we get is concurrency between the streams where there's no order specified. It can, we can have an arbitrary interleaving between the streams. So, now to create this, I need to use a uh, stream type as part of the CUDA system, okay? CUDA stream type. I create the streams using this API here. And then I've got all the data. This is stuff that we would have to create anyways that you'd be familiar with in terms of creating you know, the, the device versions of A0, B0, C0, A1, B1, C1, dot, dot, dot. Okay. And then what I do is I have the kernel loop right here, where within the kernel loop, I'm going to use the asynchronous version of memcopy. Okay. So... The asynchronous version of memcopy is very simple. It just does the memcopy command and it puts it into the stream queue that I define here. Or, I'm sorry, I have to find it up ahead, but that I'm using here and moves on. Meaning we're not waiting for the memcopy to finish before we go to the next one. Okay, so these essentially add the memcopy command to the appropriate stream queue. So 
mem copy, mem copy, <coughs> and kernel launch. So you have this kernel launch, which by default is asynchronous, also gets added to the stream queue. And then the return from the, from the device to the host also gets added to the stream queue. Okay. There we go. Question. Oh, I, maybe that's a superfluous parameter. Yeah, ignore that. Um, okay, so there we go. But this isn't really accomplishing very much. Right? Because all I'm doing is I'm looping through this, just throwing everything into stream zero. So what kind of overlap do I achieve with this? If my conceptual view of the queue is this, don't get anything, right? In fact, I get the right behavior, which is what I want, but I don't get the concurrency I want. Right? So one stream is not enough. What I need is I need to create multiple streams. <coughs> so I extend my code and I just add another stream. Stream zero, stream one. Stream zero is working on A0, B0, C0. Stream one is working on A1, B1, C1, but I've just added essentially another stream. There's no, nothing complex about the logic here other than I've just added another stream. Okay, so let's see how this all works. So what's happening is um, when, I, when I use the stream commands, the CUDA device driver, the GPU device driver, conceptually creates in software, in the device driver system software, the stream queues. Now, this is a software abstraction. So that stream zero queue, the stream one queue, essentially gets loaded up with these uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 this is not the diagram I wanted. Right here. So this is the software abstraction. Okay, so these streams get loaded up. And what's at the head of these things, or right, any of these entries, is a set of commands for running the device. Right, so there's a hardware interface that is the copy engine, there's a hardware interface that is the kernel engine that will launch the kernel on the GPU by sending the signals appropriately to the GPU, configuring the GPU to, to run the kernel. The, code has, the kernel code has to be there, blah, blah, blah. Everything has to be set up. And that's all done by the kernel engine. How that works doesn't matter, but it's a set of system software and hardware that accomplishes that. And these engines, copy engine and the kernel engine, are fed, are directed by the software streams. So if there's a copy A0, the copy engine sets everything up so that the PCI Express bus will transfer the right data from A0 into the device. And then it moves on, okay. So now if I look at it from the point of view of the engines themselves, okay. Now 
we run into an interesting thing that we have to manage. Because now the copy engine and the kernel engine are running in parallel. Okay. So what we see is, okay, stream zero, put in the mem copy A1, mem copy B1, and the kernel engine had the launch of kernel one. Okay. Now I can't launch kernel one until mem copy A1 and mem copy B1 are done. Right? Because that's the data that kernel one needs. So there has to be a set of arcs, dependencies, that hold kernel one until the corresponding copies that kernel one is dependent on are done. Okay. So this is again all part of that stack that's driving the hardware. Likewise, mem copy C1, which is copying data from the GPU back to the host, we can't execute that until kernel one is done right? because those results aren't there. So all of this is happening implicitly by the way we organize and insert the commands into the stream. Question. Okay, so the situation you're talking about is um, I, I allocate more memory than I have on the device. That command will, will have an error. What will happen to all the other commands when that command executes? Is that what you're asking? No, I think that's a fatal error. Okay. So I think at that point, nothing can proceed. Um, yes? No. No, well, I mean, I, I believe... I don't know what the latest versions of CUDA will do, but it, it's, it's done uh, in a greedy fashion. So whatever's here, I'm gonna do. And if I over allocate so that the next thing can't execute, well, the next thing can't execute. Okay, so it's not trying to be smart about allocation on the GPU side. Clearly, it would be great if it could, but maybe that's to come. All right, moving on. Now, if this is the view of the world, we don't quite get the overlap we want, right? Because what happens is I issue A1, B1, C1, kernel one. In fact, the order I issue them is A1, B1, kernel one, C1. So it creates those arcs. And then I issue in stream two, A2, B2, kernel two, C2. And now clearly the problem I'm gonna run into is all the stuff in A2, B2, C2, kernel two, everything in stream two is stuck behind everything in stream zero, or stream one in this case. Okay, it's a phenomenon that we often will call head of line blocking. Okay, if you've ever done anything involving networking or networks on a chip, um, common issue, right? You do, you've got work that can be done stuck behind work that cannot be done, head of line blocking. Um, okay, so we end up with what we started with. We don't get to where we need to get to. Are we stuck? Are we completely 
broken if, if I handed you a GPU where this is how it works. Sorry, you, you, you paid $300 for it. This is how it works. And you did this. And this is what you got. Would you be disappointed? You probably would be disappointed, but are you stuck? Is there a way around it? What can we do? The answer is yes, if I'm asking you, right? So now, how do we get around it? That's the question. Yeah. Good. You're, you've taken one step towards the right direction. Okay, the problem is if I take that C0 and I put it into its own stream, it'll execute before the kernel's done. Somehow. Okay, again, we're taking one step. Let's put more pieces together here. You're on the right track. So my answer to you is, we have all the pieces we need, okay, to completely overlap things. But how? Remember, by completely overlap, the ideal I'm trying to reach is PCI Express transferring this way, PCI Express transferring this way, CPU doing stuff. A couple of you see it. So, yeah. Let me, let me interrupt you, okay, because I, 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 it's a much easier. Okay, you, but you're, you're, so you're, let me paraphrase what you said, because I think it's valid. If we were redesigning the device driver, we can inspect the queues, the streams, stream queues, and find things to work on in parallel, reorder them, right, sure. But, you bought the graphics card. You're not writing the device driver, you're writing the CUDA code. But the CUDA code level, what can we do? I've given you all the pieces. Like all the input transfers are true. That way, it'll say, all right, transfer A0, B0, now construct a kernel. And during that, start transferring A1 and B1. Output transfers at the end. Beautiful. Exactly right. So what he's saying is, hey, I, I've got this situation. I know kind of what's going on. Uh, why not move this up explicitly? Right? It doesn't have to come after C0. I can do this whenever I want in my code. Okay. Well, I can also do B1 whenever I want with respect to C0. All I have to do in my code is just make sure that sequence is followed. And that really opens up a huge domain of things that's called software pipelining. Okay. And if you ever take 508, or if you ever take a compiler optimizations course, this idea of software pipelining is a big topic because you just, you know, we're going to do it by hand. 
in the next few slides. But it's a common transformation to remove this kind of unwanted synchronization, serialization. Okay, so what he suggested is exactly what's here, which is, okay, stream zero, A0, B0. Stream one, A1, B1. My kernels, stream zero, stream one. Copy the data back, stream zero, stream one. Good. Let's analyze this. Let's see how much better this is than the previous. Okay, so here we are. Queues will now contain A0, B0, A1, B1. We see all the dependence arcs. This is what the queue would look like. And if we look at the schedule, here's what we get. So now we're overlapping kernel C0 with the transfer of A1 and B1. And we're overlapping the transfer of C0 with the kernel compute of C1. That's all good. But the next iteration doesn't start until this. So now I really am not being able to do A2 until this clump of operations is done. So I can't start this one. I didn't, I want to pull it up here. But it doesn't happen until here. How do I pull it up here? Remember, sometimes the obvious answer is the answer. You guys are thinking too much. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> okay. Yeah, I think what you're asking is if what you're asking, by the way, is more fundamental, I think. And what you're saying is, well, why are we limited by one copy engine and one kernel engine? Okay, that only can look here. Yes, so you're asking why can't the hardware be smarter about this? Okay, right, why can't I take, so fundamentally, if I have one copy engine, okay, the copy engine can only work on one command at a time. What you're saying is why can't that copy engine take all this stuff and so right now the copy engine can't see A1 because it's hidden behind A0 and B0. It can't see C0 because it's hidden behind all the other stuff. Okay, so it's only going to do these things in the order that it sees them. Well, we could design a better copy engine that had internally more queues so that it could see A0, B0, A1, B1, see everything. And in fact, the new generations of NVIDIA hardware do that, okay? But they're still fundamentally limited by certain things, okay? Like single copy engines. You know, it doesn't make sense to have multiple copy engines because there's only one PCI Express bus. It can only be transferring one set of data between the host and the device and one set of data from the device to the host. So if there's only one copy engine I need, it can only do one thing at a time. Okay. All right, so just coming back to this, I rewrite my code. I 
kind of take A0 in A1, or, or the, the stream 0 and stream 1, and I interleave them in my code. And I'm able to achieve this nice schedule. But I hit a problem in the sense that, well, A2 and A3 aren't overlapped with A0 and A1. So you're saying, do all of them. If I, if, I, if I had 100 segments, what do I do? Do I take all of them and just rewrite? OK, I'm writing no loop, but just doing it all myself. That would be hard, right? That would be ugly. OK, so let me lead us. We picked two because we thought two would be enough. Two wasn't enough. What about three? What if I took three iterations? Stream zero, stream one, stream two. Why would three be enough? Very simple answer. Why would three be enough? Yeah? Like? Good. So really, if I think about the steady state, okay, what I really want to achieve is the transfer of C0, stream 0, the compute of C1, stream 1, and the transfer of A2, stream 2. I don't have a third or fourth or fifth thing I'm trying to do. So 3, it turns out, is enough. Right. Three streams is enough for me to get the continuous pipeline here. Okay? So what does our code look like to accomplish that? Well, I guess I don't provide it, but it's, it's what you would expect. So I would come back here and just say stream zero, stream one, stream Stream 0, stream 1, stream 2, copy the data. Three kernels. Three copies. And then loop, and loop, and loop. Question? Yeah, you can queue up freeze, although I think freeze are non-asynchronous. And the mallocs are non-asynchronous. Okay, so they will block. Okay. All right, so when we do that, we get where we want to be. Okay. Question. Go to mem copy? Okay, so... Very good question, because I think it's good to get this clear. So we've got um, the CPU is running our host code, right? So our host code is running here. Mem copies, CUDA mem copies are run on the host, right? There are host commands, there are host code, C compile it, and what that host code does is uh, works with the PCIe controller, okay, to orchestrate the data transfer. Even if the data transfer is taking data from the GPU to the CPU, all that command is running on the CPU, through the device driver, through the PCI Express controller. Does that make sense? Ask the question to 
Oh, I see what you're asking. Okay, good. Yes, they're executed by the CPU, but they're executed asynchronously, meaning the CPU launches the C0 transfer, right? So the CPU launches this, but it doesn't wait. Okay, and it launches this, it doesn't wait. It launches this, it doesn't wait. And they could, they could take milliseconds, which is a long, long, long time to complete, okay? But it's not waiting. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Question. Uh, I don't know the details. It probably depends on the GPU, the architecture, the hardware. Okay. Ideally, it's a DMA controller. So, uh, you know, there's a, a controller that's reading data from the CPU. Let's say we're doing a host to device transfer. The DMA engine's doing the direct copy, right? So it's all done autonomously by that little controller. And it's very part specific. Okay. Okay, good. So now what I want to impress upon you is this idea that, okay, there's a hardware limitation that we, we introduced that at first seemed to limit us. But then we can rewrite the software to achieve what we wanted, the ideal. Okay. This idea of software pipelining, maybe you've thought of it, maybe you've tried it. And now I'm presenting to you a formal idea around it. Okay, the idea of software pipelining. And we see it not just in cases like this, but you know, sometimes um, you know, you could take a thing like a matrix multiply loop. Okay, where we've got, you know, lots of computing happening down in that inner kernel and kind of take it and do a software pipeline around it. Right? There are lots of ways to apply this concept. Okay, so I want to end with the modern way of how these things work. Okay. Uh, Kepler, now even Kepler is an old GPU, but Kepler introduced this idea of uh, 32 hardware queues. And this is getting back to what the fellow in the back asked. Okay, so now Kepler has 32 queues where if I create a stream, that stream XYZ has a bunch of commands and the hardware will pick which queue gets to execute on the hardware engines. There's still one copy engine, there's still one kernel engine. Um, but now, because there's multiple hardware queues, we get to see more work. And we don't have to do this software pipelining explicitly. The hardware just automatically finds it for us. So we don't have this interstream dependencies that we had in when we had the single work engine. Make sense? Good. Um, just out of completeness, let me also talk about this. Um, now sometimes what we might want to do is synchronize between streams 
and uh, within streams. So the common way for us to do this synchronization is to use uh, event records. Okay. Yeah, event is a type that's a CUDA type. And what I can do is I can issue an event record, event record API call that starts an event on a stream. Never mind what the events are for the moment. The events actually are quite rich. There's a lot of things we can do with them. But then I can also use the CUDA stream wait event API call <laughs> to wait okay, for the event to complete. So the next so the event wait, the wait event. will just spin until this is complete. Okay. So if I have a bunch of commands that are going to, let's say, stream zero, and then I do a event record or event record on stream zero, and then I have a bunch more commands on stream zero. And then I do a wait event on stream zero. Nothing can go after the wait event until we've completed this record, event record. So that's a way for us to synchronize that everything prior is completed. And then I can also do a CUDA stream synchronize that's a little more blunt. And that's just saying everything prior to the synchronize is to be finished before anything that follows can be done. And there's more, there's a lot of different ways to synchronize, but there are those. So one more thing. Um, a few years ago, uh, we had somebody from the CUDA team give a guest lecture. And you know, I thought this guy, uh, actually I never met the guy uh, before, just somebody that, that NVIDIA volunteered to come and give a guest lecture. Spent the whole guest lecture talking about streams, to my surprise. I thought he was going to talk about all the neat features that you know they're going to put in the next version of CUDA. Um, you know all the tensor operations and blah 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 that, that they'll introduce. But he spent the whole time talking about streams, and I was a little surprised. But then it became clear to me that hey, the big efforts around making CUDA more powerful is all around streams. And what he was talking about was being able to take a complex concurrency graph where I've got CPU code and GPU code and this kernel is dependent on that kernel and this kernel is dependent on that one and this complex graph that we often have in our code and being able to put it into the stream API in a way that we can uh, just automatically execute stuff. So my point is, if we're looking at the forefront of CUDA, it's right here. Not in, you know, how do, how do we do this better within the threads, but here. So anyway, good. A lot of stuff to come at you, but any questions? Yeah. Uh, These are all within a stream. There are, there are ways to synchronize across streams. Yeah, qu question, question, question. Parallel. There's no dependence between them until I explicitly put something in between them. Uh, and, uh, 
Yes. 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 So then we somehow basically divide all the GPU operation while doing the um, GPU operation takes just what the stuff to increase. Well, it, no, 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 no. To be clear, um, you know the reality. Let, let me just get a blank piece of the reality is, you know, if we take a look at a typical execution of a, let's say, production CUDA kernel, okay, what we would find is you know, there's transfer and let's say there's compute. It's not the case that the transfer takes all the time and the compute takes no time. Typically, the compute takes most of the time. Okay. Um, sometimes the transfer, uh, okay, well, let me put it this way. Um, so, What we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to reduce this, right? We're trying to reduce the amount of compute time. And oftentimes, we'll reduce it quite a bit by doing all these optimizations. But sometimes what happens is the biggest chunk of time is not, I mean, I'm struggling to say this the right way. We could, okay, so here, here you are. You, you've spent all this time reducing the amount of compute. And you got it to this point. And you're wondering, what else can I do to improve my runtime? Right? You could think about, well, how do I take the compute and shrink it further? But the best thing you can do is to take this transfer time and get rid of it. See what I'm saying? So it's not that it's taking the most time, but it's the lowest hanging optimization for us to implement, right? So there's the compute. I didn't shrink the compute. It's the same amount of compute time. But then I'm doing the transfer in parallel, right? I'm not doing the transfer for this compute in parallel. I'm doing the transfer for the next compute in parallel. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know what the transfer time is. Yes. At most, yeah. But you have to look and see how much it matters, right? Uh, by looking at uh, 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 the insight tool to see where, you know, the, how much compute is in relation to the data transfer. Okay, well, very good. Um, I think we are done for today. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to stick around. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, so the class EC4908 hasn't showed up on, like, for registration yet? So. Yeah, I don't know when it will show up, but it's been approved. Okay. Um, it's hanging there. Okay. I, all, that's all I can say. I don't have any influence on who gets in and who doesn't. 
Okay. Okay. Yep. And then on a different matter, yeah. I uh, decided recently that I want to like pursue my education as like grad school, and so I was like, I wanted to reach out to you to ask for a letter of recommendation. If that was possible. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd happy to do that. The only thing I can say in the letter is what you do in the course. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then you know, I'm willing to provide more materials, like a statement of purpose, or resume that. Uh, but I don't know, right? I haven't had any experience with you, yeah, right? Of course. Okay. All I can say is, well, yeah, you took my course. Here's what the course is about, and here's the grade you got. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy to write that if that works for you. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Should I follow up with an email? About yeah. That? Yeah, that would be great. Right, thank okay. you. Yeah. What's the advantage of using a stream-driven model rather than an event-driven model? Because what you can do in OpenCL is it'll just